Boridar, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, going to talk about three things, which I hope will pick up various themes that have run through the previous presentations and kind of conclude on a, uh, uh, on, on a, a set of reflections uh, on the current constitutional moment in, uh, in the UK. Um, so I want to start with the three possibilities. So there are kind of a couple of versions of the possibilities, but the three possibilities that, uh, that Rachel mentioned at the beginning uh, and that Joe came back to, that we leave with an agreement, that we leave without an agreement, or that we remain. And as we've heard from Roger, it seems to me pretty clear that on any of those options, Wales and the UK face some really profound challenges. There's no going back. There's a sense in which, although we haven't left, Brexit has already happened. It's already happening. A series of Brexit processes are in chain that have deepened uh, divides in attitudes and expectations amongst people in Wales uh, and, across, and across the UK. There are sharply uh, divergent expectations about the future and a sense actually as well as the public attitudes that what Brexit means has become more radically different. In other words, things that might have counted as Brexit uh, in June 2016 are now Brexit in name only. Brexit has become, for many people, only properly Brexit if it's clean, if it's a decisive break. So in terms of that set of basic choices that Rachel mentioned, and which I don't think have even really been asked, never mind answered, in British uh, UK-wide public debate, you know, do we stay in the EU, do we stay close to the EU, or do we move away from the EU? Uh, um, Brexit now seems, for many people, only to mean the we move away, we move dramatically away from, from the EU. So at the level of the construction in public debate of what these different positions mean, I think there's, there has been some significant uh, movement in those, in those basic choices that underpin the options about withdrawal uh, agreements uh, and so on. So that's my first point. Uh, the second thing I want to do is to talk a little bit about, about time, about Brexit time, and this very odd sense of being trapped in an enormously significant and conflictual present, which is very, very short in its time horizon. You know, so if we think about the Conservative leadership uh, selection process, it's dominated by people and, uh, who say, unless we get out, the Conservative Party faces an existential threat unless we get out at the end of October. Right? In the elegant phrase of the man I think we've all learned to call Dom Rab, the Brexit Party will be toast unless we leave at the end of October. And yet, at least on some of these scenarios, and I guess especially given this sense that once we're out, we will have made a decisive decision, it will have been done, which given again that we've heard that we're sort of moving towards arguably the end of the beginning, but the difficult bit has yet to come, it seems to me to be pretty um, unlikely that leaving on the 31st of October will be experienced as a clean change that allows whoever's in charge of the Brexit process at that stage to say, well, it's done and dusted, and we are responsible for this great victory and living on the broad sunny uplands that are promised in various ways uh, after, after Brexit. Uh, so we have, we have that side of the discussion. We have that side of, of, of this sort of seemingly being trapped uh, in an intense unsettled present that also never really changes, and again, the sense of public attitudes and the options we're being presented with not moving on uh, is, is palpable, and yet at the same time, we're being promised 
thoughts about a very long-term future. Okay, so, um, and that's true on both sides of the partisan divide in British wide politics. So on the one hand, you know, we talk about Brexiteers. This is a vision of Britannia unchained. You know, our colleague at Cardiff University, Patrick Minford, has talked about Brexit occasioning really very substantial dramatic change in the economic underpinning of Wales and the UK. You know, the end of the car industry. Well, that seems to be happening already. The end of manufacturing in general. Right? And the idea that getting from where we are now to that future, even if that future is you know, dynamic, uh, prosperous, happy, even if Wales, even if the UK in some way becomes sort of the Singapore of the, of the North Atlantic, getting from here to there is extraordinarily difficult. One of the things that Brexit has done is that it's unveiled a series of really profound questions and issues about the UK, about you know, patterns of inequality, uh, for example, in, ac across, across the UK. And, and you know, this has motivated for many people a powerful support for um, you know, the momentum behind the Labour Party at British level. Uh, that sense of Jeremy Corbyn being um, able to mobilize a new, uh, a new vision and a new set of uh, electors uh, uh, to, fight, uh, to fight elections. And yet again, even if one imagines being able to get to that uh, new democratic socialist republic, it's not going to happen quickly. And how we get from the very foreshortened short-term political debates that grip us all around Brexit to any kind of sense of those future horizons, I think is, uh, is extraordinarily difficult. And the same is true, I think, when we start to uh, consider the Constitution and particularly consider how the UK's Constitution has, uh, has gone on, what the constitutional arrangements for governing the UK territorial territorially have been up till Brexit. So there's a sense that Brexit has unveiled an absence. We didn't really have a working set of intergovernmental relationships. That didn't exist, right? And, you know, from one optimistic point of view, you can see really sustained and serious work by some politicians and by officials to build up a system that works more effectively, that exists at least, that works more effectively than the so-called uh, joint ministerial committees, which hardly ever even met before the Brexit referendum, how that began to work. Um, we also see really serious work around common frameworks that Joe, that Joe mentioned. You know, these, are, these are critical aspects of how a devolved UK might function. Uh, but they are distinctly unequal to the huge task they face, to the heavy weight they're now being expected to bear. And that is, I think, strikingly the case uh, because one of the things that Brexit has revealed is really dramatically different understandings of the constitutional arrangements, visions of the constitution across different parts of the UK. Uh, it's reflected in a number of different areas. So you can see it in, in official documents. You know, so when Theresa May, at the beginning of her period as Prime Minister, talked about wanting to consult with the devolved governments, uh, you know, that seemed to be opening up this space within which the new arrangements uh, the new intergovernmental relationships began to be built. Uh, and then she started talking about our precious union, um, a phrase that I don't think had really been used before the Brexit debate. And, you know, from one point of view, you might say, OK, well, this is acknowledging the existence of the UK as a union made up of different parts. But it then moved over to 
strengthening our precious union, which seemed to be a kind of centralizing instinct. Uh, and in the context of the conservative um, leadership election, we've heard people talking about one nation unionism, which is a peculiar and rather paternalistic oxymoron, in my view. You know, one nation conservatism has a very distinguished lineage, but the idea that you need a union of a single nation is hard for me, at least, to wrap my head around. <laughs> Uh, in work I've been doing with, uh, with Greg Davis, we've also looked at the way that key stages in this Brexit process have been, particularly court cases, have been understood in the media in the four parts of the UK. And those understandings are really quite fundamentally different and divergent. Uh, and so, um, there's a real challenge there, I think, in that we have a union of differences and of limited mutual understandings across the different parts of the UK. Now, there are bits that work better. So through the intergovernmental negotiations, a really powerful alliance between the Scottish government and the Welsh government emerged, which in one sense might feel kind of implausible, so, you know, an independence-minded Scottish National Party government with a pro-devolution but ultimately pro-union Welsh government nevertheless found common ground across a range of issues. They broke apart around uh, whether or not to give content, con consent to the EU Withdrawal Act that Joe talked about. Um, and lots of people heralded that moment as, oh, you know, this impossible alliance has now been fundamentally broken, and yet they've come back together and worked practically in important ways. And I think that's been uh, a critical element in balancing the relationship between the UK centre and the devolved parts, that, Scotland and Wales in particular. Um, nevertheless, the UK as a whole just as it's not very good at facing up to the basic dilemmas and choices that Brexit poses us, isn't particularly good at standing back and thinking, so what should the Constitution look like overall? And what, we, what I fear we're seeing, and again this picks up points that Joe was making, we're seeing you know, officials working in good faith, working hard, to come to practical arrangements about particular things in common frameworks. The idea of uh, uh, you know, the UK's internal market and so on, you know, perfectly good faith discussions, and yet particular decisions on specific issues will, may well end up quietly behind our backs reformulating the UK's constitutional arrangements uh, and my sense is that's particularly the case if we end up in a kind of emergency situation. And again, as Joe has said, there's a lot of evidence about, especially at the, at, at the Whitehall level, but also to some extent in the devolved governments, of governments necessarily taking powers to themselves to deal with an emergency situation. I mean, I had never heard of local resilience committees until I was involved in planning for the no deal possibility in March. You know, these are local committees that were set up to deal with outbreaks of aggressive uh, uh, contagious diseases. So they weren't really designed for these particular civil contingencies. Um, and in that kind of emergency, there's a possibility, I think, of a real centralization that reformulates the UK's constitutional arrangements without anyone ever really having thought about whether that's what they were supposed to do. So I want to try and end on a positive note. <laughs> and the positive note is back to the long term. So I, I do think there's something critically important about the way that Brexit has unveiled a whole series of problems, you know, some of them about territorial inequalities in the UK's uh, economy, about imbalances in 
the constitutional arrangements for the UK. Um, and I think there is something about trying to think in the very long term, something that I don't think has been a particularly strong feature of political cultures across the UK. You know, I'm struck uh, by the fact that Extinction Rebellion in the UK has attracted much more support than in almost any other European country. And I think that's partly to do in a way that I can't quite grasp as a, as a, as a uh, socio-legal scholar or a social scientist, but it's partly to do with people across the generations, but particularly young people, being confronted with a situation where they have to think about the very long term. And so I think trying to get some sense of that, of injecting a long-term perspective and thinking about how we get from the current logjam to different kinds of possible futures and having a proper political and social debate about those is the thing I'm going to hold on to as a, as a potential positive out of our current situation. Thank you very much. Jeff and Brad.